Alrighty, so tonight what we're going to be going over, um, it's interesting, last week we went over Mystery Babylon, we went over pretty much Roman Catholicism, a lot of, uh, not, we didn't cover conclusively a lot of their doctrines and things like that, but tonight I want to talk about the heresy of Calvinism. Okay, so tonight we're going to be going over the heresy of Calvinism. Um, I think it's very important to you know, understand what, what do we believe and why do we believe it. And not only that, but what do others believe? You know, there's so many, there's so many denominations out there, and this is one of the most exhaustive things about being a Bible-believing Christian is we are to search the Scriptures to see whether these things are so. You're never to just take a man's word for it. You're never to just, you know, listen to however you were brought up. You're always supposed to take whatever you hear and compare it to the Scriptures. There's a lot of different, uh, they call it like systematic teachings of the Bible and things. Um, we covered a, a couple weeks ago. We covered about the heresy of hyper dispensationalism, and uh, had a couple comments on that. Which obviously, you know, hyper dispensationalists disagreed. And pretty much all the nine points that I listed, he had something to say about you know how well we're not we're not we're not to be born again because Paul never talks about it, or we're not to confess our sins because Paul doesn't say verbatim confess our sins. And you know, he went on and on and came right back with the with how can you refute these things i mean with the same verses it's like he's like oh, i'm going to correct you with this and that and it gets crazy but i'm sure there's going to be a lot of people on the contrary with calvinism that you know there's like there's two extremes with this thing you know people you're either very against calvinism or you're just all out calvinist now uh just some some history on this uh john calvin okay so started off with a guy named john calvin uh, born 1509 to 1564, he was a French theologian. He was a pastor. He was a reformer in Geneva during the Protestant Reformation. He was a principal figure in the development of the system of Christian theology, later called Calvinism, including its doctrines of predestination. We're going to talk about that. Uh, in God's absolute sovereignty in the salvation of the human soul from death and eternal damnation. You can spot a lot about a Calvinist when they talk about the sovereignty of God, you know, the, the sovereignty of God. You hear that word used from, um, you know, they don't, they don't just call themselves Calvinists, of course. They go under uh, many Presbyterians. They're five-point Calvinists. Many, what you see, Reformed, Reformed churches, they're Calvinist. Even Baptist churches, you have to look under certain Baptist churches, they're Calvinist. Um, so that a lot of people subscribe to that systematic teaching of Scripture. Um, Calvinist, Calvinist doctrines were influenced by and elaborated upon the Augustinian and other Christian traditions. So there was a guy named Augustine. Augustine was a devout Roman Catholic, okay? And they, uh, pretty much John Calvin got a hold of Augustine and pretty much built upon what Augustine kind of ha had in line with the whole predestination and uh, stuff like that. Um, okay, various congregational Reformed and Presbyterian churches which looked to Calvin as the chief expositor of their beliefs have spread throughout the world. So I told you, Presbyterians, Reformed churches, and even some Baptist churches are Calvinist. Now, there's another guy that we've got to be familiar with. We've got to be familiar with a guy named um, Jake, Jacobus Arminius. So you're either, people always put you in two categories. They either say you're a Calvinist or you're an Arminian. Now, to sum it down, make it simple in layman's terms, a Calvinist pretty much believes there's no free will. Okay? An Arminian believes in free will. Okay, yeah, I agree with that. Okay, I believe in free will, which we're going to get into. Calvinists do not believe in that. Calvinists, um, well, back in the old day, they didn't, they, I think today they believe in eternal security. They had to change some words, which we'll see. But our, uh, our, the Arminians, they don't believe in eternal security. They believe that you, you get saved, and next thing you know, you can lose your salvation. So I don't obviously agree with that. So no doubt that there would be some truths found in certain individual things that John Calvin did and the guy named Jacob Arminius. Just a couple, uh, a little history on him. Jacob Arminius was a Dutch theologian during the Protestant Reformation, a uh, period whose views become the basis of Arminianism in the Dutch Remonstrant movement. He served from 1603 as a professor in theology at the University of uh, Leyenden and wrote many books and treaties on theology. Following his death, his, uh, his challenge to the Reform Standard, the Belgic Confession, provoked ample discussion at the Syndod of Dort. Okay, that was a meeting with, where a bunch of these Dutch reformers met and stuff to settle the controversy of, of Arminianism. Okay, they came, to, they came together to settle the controversy of Arminianism and then they crafted these five points um, of Calvinism in response to Jacob Arminius' teachings. Okay, and uh, 
Okay, in, attempt, uh, in attempting to defend Calvinistic predestination against the teachings of Dirk Volchitzen, I can't, there's no way, Volker Jitzen Zun, Kuhnhart, um, Arminius began to doubt aspects of Calvinism and modified some parts of his own view. Okay, he attempted to reform Calvinism and lent his name to the movement Arminianism, all right, which uh, resisted some of the Calvinist tenets, such as unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, um, things like that. And now the reason why I'm kind of taking this time, because you're going to run into these people, when you, if you ever argue or debate with a Calvinist, you're going to see that they try to be very scholarly. They try to be very, you know, intellectual, and, and they get real, you know, about the church fathers and church history, and that's why we ought to, we ought to know some things. We ought to know some terms of, you know, John Calvin, we got to know some terms of Arminius, they're gonna, they're, you know, you're gonna call me an Arminian, and I'm gonna call you a Calvinist, and all that. You gotta know, know some of the history behind it. Um, now, uh, now there's, you know, there's an old joke that since Calvinists they don't believe in free will, and Arminians do. Many people would say, well, I'm an Arminian until I get to Calvary, and then once I get to Calvary, then I'm a Calvinist because Calvinists were supposed to believe in preservation of the saints. You know, if you get that, then you do. If you don't get it, you don't. But it's if you have free will. You know, I believe in, I have free will that I can receive Christ to Calvary. And then after Calvary, then I become a Calvinist because they supposedly believe in eternal security. Whereas the Armenians do not believe in, um, well, they do believe in eternal security and they do believe in free will. Um, all right, so now I'm going to start off with, they have a, a five-point system, okay? When they, and they, it's the acronyms for, for it are TULIP. So I would write these down. I'd be familiar with the acronyms of, of TULIP, okay? Um, now, first off, we're going to start off with T. Okay, which means total inability. Okay, now what this what this says? Okay, call it in Calvinism total depravity. That's what they're call it. Okay, they're called total depravity or also total inability. Okay, but actually taught as total the total inability of man to choose truth. So they like once again they get rid of choice. Okay, a Calvinist they're going to play word games and things like that. And um, in the Word of God, we're going to clearly see that it teaches that God created man with the ability to reason, with the ability of choosing, um, and the ability to receive or reject the truth. Because you get into Calvinism where God elected certain people to heaven, then what's the opposite of that? Well, then he must have elected certain people to hell. Now, there's a, there's a whole big attack on, that's, even, that's against the character of God. Why would God create a bunch of robots and things like that? People no free will and say, I'm going to save some of them, and I'm going to, you know, just damn these people to hell. Because that, that'll tell you that there's babies that are just going to hell then. If you really push that thing that far. Well, if, if you're elect, you know, then, that, then there's such thing as an unelect baby that gets sent to hell. I mean, there's a lot of crazy troubles with that. So first off, let's go to Ephesians 2.8. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. I got tons of verses here. All right. I think last, uh, the hyper, uh, hyper dispensationalist, Heresy that went an hour and 40 minutes <laughs> with a lot of scripture. Now, hopefully I get through this thing uh, relatively quick. Um, you know, you could spend a great deal of time on this, but I'm going to just give you the, the pretty much the basics of this. So right, we're, we're, first off, we're going to look at what the T stands for, total inability. All right, now look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Now, you know, we're actually very familiar with this verse, right? Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. So right there, they take this and say, well, it's not yourselves. Salvation is purely on the gift of God. You have no ability to choose uh, or reject the truth. He either, cho- or he either, you know, for by grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourselves. You have no part on your salvation in a sense, in a sense of receiving him. Now, they get into these fancy words. I think one of it was, um, I can't remember the term. Uh, what was it? System, mono, mono or um, synergistic something. It's either, you know, it's either all God or it's you. Because the, here's, the, here's what they're playing. They're saying, well, you believing and receiving Jesus Christ is a work. They want to put our belief in receiving as a work. So we, we really do, in a sense, have a part of receiving the grace of God. Look, it's really read as, for by grace are you saved. Well, how do we get, how do we get access to God's grace? Through faith, 
in that not of yourselves, what's not of ourselves? Grace, the grace of God. It is the, it is, uh, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, um, let's look at another one. Look at Romans 10, 17. Look at Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. Now, you know, how, how do we really receive this faith? They play, they're play these word games also with like, well, you know, God gives you certain measures of faith. I heard that being used before. And, and any time you hear about this measure of faith, I don't know if I have the verse in here, it's not, definitely not in context with, with faith as in receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. No doubt that I believe that everybody is dished out a certain, some people have more faith than others. Some people have more grace than others. There's two different things. You hear, see that in the Bible, measure of faith and a measure of grace. We'll get to that when we study Romans eventually. Some people have more grace than others, some people don't. So God does, there's, there's certain, you know, I don't know if it's in the sense of God doing it, but how could we increase our faith? Well, look at Romans 10, 17. I'm sorry, Romans, yeah. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You've got to hear the word of God, okay? And faith, that's how faith comes, okay? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. How about, uh, look at James 1.21. James 1.21. Okay, they're, they're say that it's, you know, total depravity. In other words, that man is so depraved of sin, that we're so wicked, so vile, that we can't even make the right, we can't even make the right choice. It's it, God got to make everything for us. He got to do everything for us, Okay. That's, that's what they're, what they're press about it. And it sounds good. You know, it's all God. It's all the Lord. Okay, you know, there's a, okay, that sounds good and all. But you just cannot get rid of man's ability to reason and choose for themselves. From the very Garden of Eden, he gave them a choice. You eat of the tree of knowledge or you eat of the, eat of the, um, the, of the tree of life and stuff. He gave them a choice, okay? Um, look, at, look at James 1.21. James 1.21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. So there you go. I want to circle the word, obviously, to receive. There's something on your part that you have to do. You've got to receive. Look at Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Isaiah 1, 18. Isaiah 1, 18. I, I would make notes on this. I keep this in your Bible. You know, I write these all down because you're going to stumble upon a Calvinist. You're going to stumble upon, you know, people getting into theology and, and talking about these things. Um, look at Isaiah 118. And I write these all down under the, under the acronym T, which is total inability or total depravity. Look at Isaiah chapter 1. I always like this verse. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Okay, it says, Come now. And let us reason together. There's an invitation. Come now, okay? Say it the Lord. Though your sins... Uh, well, what he's, what he, well, another word I would circle there is, come now, let us reason together. What's the point of reasoning together with God or reasoning with Him if He just makes all the choices for you when you think of it? There's something you've got to receive, and God will... He, he's reasonable. He'll reason with you. Come now, let us reason together. Say it the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Okay? Look at Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, 19. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I mean, you know, you could really cut this thing really short, and you could just look up how many times does the word choose show up in Scripture? How many times does the word, you know... Um, you know, choice, or here's a big one, free will. They don't believe in free will. Yet the Bible, the Word shows up 17 times in Scripture. I mean, to, for, to say that you don't believe in free will, that's obviously to say that you don't really believe in the Scripture. All right, look at Deuteronomy chapter uh, 30, verse 19. Um, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. There's choice there, okay? 
Look at Joshua 24. This is another big one. Joshua 24, Deuteronomy. Joshua, next book. Joshua chapter 24. Look at verse number 15. And now, could you imagine, you know, dealing with Calvinists? Then forget about, forget about witnessing. What are you out there wasting your time witnessing for? What are you out wasting your money and stuff like that? Sending missionaries over. If God already got the thing figured out and already made a decision for you, that, that completely erases the ability of soul winning in trying to reach souls for Christ. Uh, so, you know, th throw that out if, if, um, you know, if you run into Calvinists and stuff. There's no, no point of even witnessing and in, in bringing people the gospel and stuff. Look at Joshua chapter 24, look at verse 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord... Choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether it be the gods, and that, that verse, it's in people's houses, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay? Joshua tells them to choose. Um, all right, look at Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Psalms 119, look at verse number 30. Psalm 119, look at verse 30. Here's what David says. You know, it's sad. I hate to get kind of personal, but, you know, we have people in my family that would believe in Calvinism, and then there would be certain people, let's say, we're sitting around a table and we're talking about... So I'm trying to be very careful when it comes to, you know, sitting so-called debating or arguing or around lost people when it comes to the Bible. You know, I've got to be real careful with that. I kind of, like, tend to, okay, now's not the right time. you got to get these people one-on-one -on -one and stuff because when a lost person looks at you, and sees, well, well, I believe that God already made the choice for you. He predestined some to go to heaven, some go to hell. And then there's the opposite people in the room, people that believe in free will, people that believe in receiving. And then there's a lost person in the room. They're like, well, how do I know if God just, if I'm just not done for as it is? Where's the hope in that? There's no hope. And that kind of completely eradicates the hope of that lost person because they're hearing this, this debate about Calvinist and free will and, and receiving Christ or or. Uh, predestination and all of these terms and stuff like that that they try using. So we're gonna we're gonna get to that. But right now we're just looking at the um, the ability to choose. Okay, look at Psalm 119 verse 30. Look at uh, it says I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I've uh, stuck unto thy testimonies. Notice what that's David doing something. He chosen the way of truth. Now we get the full revelation that I've chosen Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I received him. Um, you know, I stuck under that testimony. It's something that you got to do. All right, look, here's a, here's a real good one. Look at John chapter 1, verse 12. John 1, verse 12. And Danielle, you were meeting that guy at the gym or whatever, talking about running into uh, questions about, you know, he believes that God's in all. He's all and all. You know, you run into those people, all and all. Well, you know, you don't get in God, okay? God don't get in you until, this is a great verse, uh, John 1, 12. Look what it says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. There's something that you got to do. You got to receive the gospel, okay? Now, we're going to get into a verse that Calvinists use where they say, well, see, it says Christ died for many. So they say, therefore, Christ only died for the elect. They use those terms. Christ only died for the elect. Well, okay, Christ, uh, he only died for many. And we're, this gets into the thing of limited atonement, where when Christ shed his blood, he wasn't... I believe Christ shed his blood for Judas Iscariot. Okay, I do. I believe Jesus Christ shed his blood for the most vilest and wicked person of all. The, you know, they get into this stuff about the decrees of eternal reprobation, which is you're so, you're, you're so far gone and you know, you're, you're, you're a reprobate and that's how God chose you from the beginning. Well, what, what is that? Doesn't that kind of sound like, well, kind of, well, God made me this way, so forget about my ability to ever repent and try to change my lifestyle at all because God already did it all for me. There's a lot of wickedness just with just taking away your choice. And it's funny, though. You aren't walking there a Calvinist, yet they go down at the voting polls and vote and stuff like that. What are you doing voting for? You know, what are you all patriotic for and voting for if God already said forget about And, you know, I just I elected the guy as it is. You know, you had nothing to do with it. You know, not, not to get into the whole thing of election and all that, but you get what I'm saying. 
Um, all right, look at uh, look at Second Timothy two, Second uh, Timothy chapter one, Second Timothy chapter one, Second Timothy chapter one. Look at verse number, uh, verse number twelve. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. You know, look what Paul says. For, these, uh, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. Okay, that's something, you know, I have believed. You either believed or you never believed before. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Okay, that's something you got to do. You know, so c commitment either you know believing receiving i have chosen you could you could clearly see those you know already look at second peter chapter 3 look at verse 9 another one of the go to verses that you know if you're against calvinism this is a go to one that mo you hear most people use and this is a, this is a fair verse to use no doubt it's a good it's a great one look at second peter chapter 3 verse 9 it says the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. Do you really see what the will of the Lord is? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you've got to kind of change some things and say, not willing that the elect should perish, but that the elect will come to repentance. You can't do that. And that's a great verse. Not willing. That any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's clear. And we're going to look at some of these obscure verses where it says, well, it seems like God made these vessels of dishonor for the purpose of him, his destruction. What the Calvinists will do is they'll always go to these obscure verses rather than, you know, in a, in a role of interpretation with the Bible is always interpret the obscure in the light of the clear verse. Never build a, a big doctrinal thing, a big, you know, what I believe, from something that's obscure. I don't really kind of know what this is saying. This isn't really clear. You take the clear verses that you got the understanding for, that's how you interpret the obscure one. Does that make sense? Okay, that's a really big thing to get, and they're going to go to that. And we're going we're gonna to get to those verses too, but 2 Peter 3, 9, very clear verse. Lord's not willing any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All right, repentance. We know what repentance means? Repentance means of a change of mind and a change of heart of some things. Repentance doesn't, you know, doesn't mean, okay, you have to repent to get saved. Repentance, it was tied off with sinning. Okay, we studied repentance a while ago. Repentance is change of mind, change of heart, and change of mind about your sins. Repenting for what you are. I'm a sinner. Okay, then yeah, you could repent for what you did and clean up your life and things like that. But the Lord repented. Remember that? The Lord changed his mind. It repented me that made man on the earth and stuff. All right, look at Ezekiel 30, 33, 11. Ezekiel 33, 11. Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel 33, look at verse 11. He says, Say unto them as I liveth, Ezekiel 33, 11. We're still under, uh, you know, total inability. Okay, the, you know, the, there's no choice. You have no choice in it at all. Look at Ezekiel 33, 11. Say unto them as I liveth, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. That's a, that's a merciful God. Like Peter said, he's merciful. He's long-suffering toward us. We're not willing any should perish. And he says, Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? you imagine that being stuck in evil ways, being stuck in your sin? And saying, well, I forget, this is just how God made me. I'm just, I'm foreordained from the foundation of the earth. It's predestinated for me to go to hell. That's wicked, you know? I mean, that, then what's it do? Gives you, gives you an excuse to continue in sin. When you think about that. Look at, um, let's see, do I, do I have one on that? Well, yeah, we're going to get to that. All right, the next, next letter is, uh, is U. Remember, this, we're studying their, their acronym. Okay, maybe I'll write it on the board. The acronym... I'm about to erase this. The acronym is TOLA. So T okay, equals total 
depravity slash inability. Okay, next one is you, and that's unconditional election. Uh, I don't know how to spell. T U L I P. Okay. All right, next one is you, it's unconditional election. Now, Calvinism teaches that God selects those who are to be saved without any condition, okay? But the Bible teaches that there is something that you do that is not considered a work, okay? When we know Paul talks about, you know, but according to, you know, not, not by works of righteousness, which I have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Okay, so we know that what Paul says, like, for example, calling upon the name of the Lord, or, you know, uh, if thou believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Belief is not a work. Calling upon the name of the Lord is not a work. Okay, people get on to this whole thing of, of what is a work or not. Jordan? Calling upon the name of the Lord for salvation or as prayer in general? Um, just as a prayer in general. And prayer in general, uh, yeah, and that's another thing. Pra I, I believe prayer in general is not a work. I mean, you know, I, now here's the thing, though. There's a fine line with that, okay? You don't just pray a prayer and then you're saved, or else what's the point of the gospel? Let that sink in. You don't just say, oh, God, please, you know, save me. And if God saved you, you know, well, you, have to, you definitely have to understand that Christ died for your sins. He buried, he rose again the third day. You have to receive that. You have to receive the gospel. Um, you know, so prayer, you know, it's not like, well, I, pr I prayed this prayer, therefore I'm saved. Well, you're not counting on the right thing. You see what I'm saying? So, all right, so un unconditional election is God chose you with no condition. Okay, you're just unconditionally uh, chosen. Let's look at a verse. Let's look at 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Here's, here's what they're used. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. And we're going to cover this verse later on too under, uh, under another point also. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren. He's talking to saved Christians. Beloved of the Lord, because God hath chosen, or because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Now if there was a period there, they might have a case. Now look at that. God says he chose you to salvation. But look. Through sanctification of the Spirit, okay, the Lord, sanctification, the setting apart of the Spirit, through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now you keep on going, Where, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're called by the gospel. Okay, now they, they we're going to get into another verse in Proverbs, really, to where the Lord can call you and call you, and yet you have the ability to refuse Him. We're, we're, we're probably looking at a verse now. I should, have, I should have that in there. It's in the book of Proverbs. Um, okay, let's look, at, um, let's look at Romans chapter 9. I'm going to show you that one passage here. Romans chapter 9 on the whole what-if uh, thing here. Romans chapter 9. Look at this. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 22. Okay, the vessels of wrath. Okay, they're going to, they're going to this passage of Scripture a lot. And Calvinists, they're always going in circles. They're taking you to a couple parts. They're taking you to the chosen. They're taking you to the predestinated, the predestination verses. Then they circle you back around and you go to Romans chapter 9. And then you give them another one. Then they go right back around, back to the predestination. They, it's just, it's just a, a, a full big circle. So you've got to know uh, this chapter, Romans chapter 9. Look at verse number... You know what, let's, just, let's read the whole thing. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 17. For the scripture, um, you know, they, they, even, they use a little bit more than that. Let's go, back to, um, let's go back to Romans 9, verse 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. I don't, I don't have no problem with that. God's obviously the one showing, showing mercy. Now, look at verse 17. 
For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, okay, even, uh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, and I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will hardeneth. Now, no, so now see that. They say, well, see, look, he has mercy on whom he has mercy, but he, har he, he could harden people. Now, there's, there's two things working there. If you read the Old Testament, you have seen where the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. You get to that. But you also read that Pharaoh hardened his heart. So it's, you know, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh made his own mind up that he was stubborn. He was not, you know, he was not, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I have those references down, but you'll see that how, you know, he hardened his own heart by his own will and therefore allowing God to continue to harden his heart. Now this gets in the whole thing of uh, um, God's permissive will. I don't think Calvinists believe, or I could be mistaken, I, don't think, I can't reconcile it though, I don't think they believe in God's permissive will. Okay, there's, there's the God's directive will. I'm not, will, I'm not willing that any should perish, but it also come to repentance, but people perish. People go to hell. So there's, I believe in God's directive will and God's permissive will. That is, what does he allow? What does he permit? Okay, um, he, you know, he, uh, for, you know, for Pharaoh, God allowed that to happen, and God obviously used Pharaoh in the sense of, showing his signs and wonders throughout all the land of Egypt. Let's keep reading them. Look at verse 19. That will say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Who hath resisted his will? Well, a lot of people have. A lot of people resist the will of God when you think of it. Look at verse 20. Nay, nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Ain't that a big one? Why'd you make me like this? You know, should, we, should we ever say that to God? I, mean, I, I believe we have no business saying that to God. Because you, know, you go real too far with it. And, well, you made me like this. And you made me a murderer. And you made me a homosexual. Or you made me a thief. And you made me a, you know, this, this vessel unto dishonor and stuff. Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor, and another unto dishonor. There's two kinds. Now look at verse 22. What if? Come down to verse 24, question mark. You know, Dr. Reckman has a good note on that, though. You know, don't ever want to build a whole doctrinal belief on a what if statement. What if? You know, think about that. You know, this, these, if you know how Paul talks, these hypothetical things that Paul, you, if, if Christ be not risen from the dead, then your faith is vain. He knew without a shadow of doubt Christ rose from the dead. What are you even talking like that for? That's part of his, his hypothetical way of how he, how he speaks and stuff. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory? So that's what they're good for. Let's have a look. For beforehand, he prepared those certain vessels for, uh, you know, but you got to get the bigger picture of it. You can't just be hung up on this one chapter. you got to get the whole broad spectrum of things here. And that he might make known the riches of his glory and the vessel of mercy, which he hath afore prepared unto glory, even unto us, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Notice how that thing ends with a question mark. Now, let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. So what about those vessels, those dishonorable vessels? Can you ever be a dishonorable vessel and then all of a sudden become a vessel of honor? Okay, if I just stuck in that passage right there, it would seem like, well, God made them this way for this certain reason to exercise God's wrath on them. And then he made these people before the foundation of the world from a time, And he's going to show his glory and his long suffering and mercy towards these people. Now, if you're just stuck in that chapter, you may have a case. But you keep reading, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 20. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver. Now, I always like the illustrations that Paul uses. Paul talks about we are a building of God. We'll build up, a, uh, Peter talks about we'll build up a spiritual household. Um, you know, uh, you know the, the whole thing of a, a great house, okay? And it's almost like another the body of Christ. 
not to get too deep in how the Christians, remember how Christians are composed of, in New Jerusalem? We are, you know, that, if we study that in, against the hyper-dispensationalist, we, we have part of that city, and we're, we're like a building. Uh, Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So he says, But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. Look at this. Some to honor, some to dishonor. Do we remember the judgment seat of Christ? How what, what works that we've done? Every man's work shall be tried, whether it be good or bad. And we've seen gold, silver, precious stone. And we looked at wood, hay, stubble. They burn up. Okay. Now, now look at this, though. Some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these. Purge. That's to get rid of. That's to exterminate, to, to clean, in a sense. Purging. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. So get away from the wood in the, in the, in of earth. The, you know, you could, the earth, the, the fleshy Christians, the earthly Christians, and, you know, try to, you know, try to build, build your foundation upon the things of Christ and lay up gold, silver, and precious stones and things. Some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, something that he has to do, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, that's set apart, okay, and meet, that's fitting, that's fit for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust. He goes on. But avoid full of, these are things that you have to do. If you if you flee youthful lusts, follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Calling upon you know, calling upon the Lord out of the pure heart, right motive and stuff. So that I think it's pretty clear that if you have a change of mind, you repent, you can go from being a dishonorable vessel to an honorable vessel. Okay? Look at first Corinthians chapter four. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Corinthians 4. Now look what, look what Paul says here. 1 Corinthians 4, 15. Uh, he says, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. And look at this. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. You know, and it's funny, the hyper-dispensationalist said, I don't believe in born again. Well, what are you, what, what you going to do that Paul has begotten them? Because he never used the term, you know, born again and all that. Okay, now that verse, it's a great verse for, I do believe you are born again. Not only that, Paul says, I have begotten you through the gospel. That's something that Paul gave. I mean, it's almost like Paul, you know, took credit almost for that, in a sense. Wherefore, I beseech you, be followers of me. He birthed them again. He begotten them. Through, well, what's the means on how they got begotten? Through the, the gospel that was delivered under the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. You know, the gospel which was delivered me was not after man. You read Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 through 12 again. So, uh, Paul begot them through the gospel. Now, here's another thing I think of. If you just did a Bible study on conditional clauses, because remember, they say this is unconditional. God chooses you without any condition at all, unconditional election. Um, if you just do a study on conditional clauses, that's if and then clauses, how, what's the point of having if and then conditional clauses if, there's, if it's unconditional? And there's tons of them in the Bible. You know, you got, there's no time to even go through. You read the Old Testament. If you do this, then I'll do that. If you do that, then I won't. If you don't do that, then I won't do this. You see them conditional clauses are there, okay? Okay. Um, uh, I just, uh, word study, choose shows up 59 times. Choice shows up 21 times. Free will shows up 17 times. Now what I want to turn to now is we're going to look at the word elect. We're going to look at this word elect in the Bible. And I always like the, I like an old saying that a preacher once said. He says, well, you can't be elected until you become a candidate. Okay, then what's a candidate for election? Well, for all have sinned. Anybody. Anybody's a candidate. Christ died for, you know, for everybody. He died for all sinners. So you have to be, you know, in order to be a candidate, you're a sinner, then you get elected, okay? Now, let's see, let's look at, um, let's look at Isaiah 54. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to do a, a word study here on elect. Isaiah chapter 45, Isaiah 45. Now, I'm going to tell you, you're going to find in these passages that, uh, okay, elected shows up in the Bible once, election shows up six times. 
Okay. Um, elect. I don't know how. I don't know why I don't have that. That's that in here. But elect. Anytime you see the word election or elected, it's for a service. Okay. You're elected for a service. And here's a, a general illustration of it. Is in a country. Okay. A citizen is selected. Okay. Or is elected for a specific service. Okay. Um, a citizen is chosen or elected to a service. Uh, they are not elected to become a citizen. They are a candidate first, okay, and then they are elected to that service. Um, look at Isaiah chapter 45. Look at verse, uh, verse number 4. Now let's look at this, who this, who this elect is. And this is the first time this shows up actually in the Bible. So by the law of first mention, remember that general rule of Bible interpretation is usually how the, you, you find where that word shows up first, and that will generally give you the meaning on how that word is used throughout the rest of the Bible. Look at Isaiah 45.4. For Jacob, who's that? Anybody know who Jacob is? Yeah, who, anybody, know, anybody know who Jacob is? Jacob is Israel. Okay. For Jacob, my servant's sake, ain't that something though? Right away, you see that word servant even there. It has to do with service. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. I have called thee by my name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Okay? God chose Israel. He, he elected Israel, elected J Jacob for a specific service to really dispense the truth of God out. You know, God revealed himself to we have a Jewish book here and stuff. He could have picked any other people. He, he elected a group of people for a specific service. Look at Isaiah 65. So right there, you'll see first off, Israel, Jacob, is, ele is the elect. Mine elect. Look at Isaiah 65, 9. Here's another one. Isaiah 65, 9. And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob. All right. And out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains. And mine elect shall inherit it. And once again, my servants shall dwell there. So just a basic definition on it. We're trying to understand what is this, the, what this word elect means. What's it in context to? Am I elected to salvation or am I elected to to a specific service, a specific calling, or, you know, so to say. Let's look at, look, look at Isaiah 65, verse 22. They shall not build in another habit. They shall not plant in another eat. As for the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They, they, you know, they shall not labor in vain. Once again, you see work, you see labor, in the context of, um, of an election, of being elected. They work. All right, look at, um, look at Romans. Let's go to the New Testament. You know, well, we could, we could pause there, actually. Let's, go back, let's look at Matthew 24 there real quick while we come across from this. Because this is a big one, obviously, that, um, you know, not any Calvinists that, that I talk to, they don't, uh, they don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. And they're, they'll take you right away to the Matthew chapter 24. Right away, this is the this is the main proof text chapter of a post tribulation rapture. All right, now if you remember, we we talked a long while ago about I don't know the seven or ten raptures in the Bible. There's any, we're not there's just you know the mystery of the body of Christ to catching away. Yeah, that's that's one thing. That's a, that's one rapture toward us. But there's many. We looked at Elijah. We looked at Enoch. We looked at Jesus Christ. We looked at uh, you know a couple others and stuff. Um, but here's one. Here's a clear one. Look at Matthew chapter uh, 24, verse number, let's see, uh, uh, we could go to verse 22. Yeah, verse 22. Except those days shall be shortened, there shall be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sakes, sake, those days shall be shortened. And then look at verse 20, uh, 31. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds, and from one end of heaven to the other. 
I learned the parable of a fig tree. He goes on, and you know, I don't have time to expound that chapter. He's gathering the nation of Israel. Okay, that's a post-tribulation rapture of the elect. Read that passage, and you, and you try to find the body of Christ in that passage. Let them to be in Judea and flee to the mountains. I got, I got no business in Judea. I got no business keeping a Sabbath day. This is a context of Jews. He's speaking to Jews before the cross. Okay? He's speaking to his disciples and stuff. Um, elect has to do with Israel. All right, look at, look at Romans 9.27. Romans 9.27. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I don't have I don't have the word here, but it's a good verse though. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Now you can make some, you know, you can infer that the, the, the remnant is God's uh, elected, in a sense, God's elect, the remnant of Israel that gets saved at the end of the tribulation. Look at, uh, what about Romans 11, verse 5? He talks about it again here. Look at Romans 11, look at verse 5. Even so then, at this present time, there also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more uh, grace, otherwise work is no more work. So in other words, you either pick a way to get saved. You're either saved by grace, or you're either saved by works. You know, and obviously we're saved by God's grace. Okay, and in our faith, believing on, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Believing, that's not a work. Look at verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Okay, according as it is written, God hath given, given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. And he goes on uh, speaking in the context of, uh, of Israel again. How about, look at Colossians. Look how Paul uses it here. Look at Colossians. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Every, most, almost every time, I'm going to show you one exception to where elect, uh, elect is, talking to, about the body of Christ. I'll show you that verse 2. Look at, first off, let's look at Colossians 3, verse 12. Colossians 3, 12. In, in verse 3, 11, he talks about where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and all. Put on, therefore, and he says, as the elect of God. That's, that's Colossians 3, verse 12, I'm sorry. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Now, back in the Old Testament, there were people that were holy. There were people that were beloved. There were people that God had mercy on. And the general idea of this is speaking of, you know, in Israel. And he says, as the elect, okay? Look at, uh, look at 1 Thessalonians. This is the first occurrence where it's your election, okay? You could, you could look up the references of elected, election, elect. You'll see Israel's always right in the picture of this, okay? Now, we're going to look at this verse now. now. But also remember the other definition of elect has to deal with some type of service. So look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look at... Uh, Let's see, look at, look at, let's go back to verse number 3 here, okay? Remembering without ceasing, okay, verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith in labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, uh, brethren beloved, your election of God. You're, what's he talking about? Knowing your election of God, this has nothing to do with your salvation. He's, he's commending them uh, for their labor, work, patience of hope. Once again, it's, it's in association with, um, with your service. Look at, uh, here's another time this word shows up. 1 Timothy 5.21. 1 Timothy 5. 1 Timothy 5.21.
Yes. Wait, wait, which one? Oh, yeah, well, see, that, that gets in the whole thing of two. Is, when, remember we studied this before, that some shall depart from the faith? When Paul's talking about holding on to the faith and all the, about the faith, not all the time is that speaking of faith and salvation. You know, a lot of times it's, it's literally faith in what Paul delivered them. Look, you got to work, you got to provide, you got to, you know, if any man provide not for his own, he's worse than an infidel and, de- and has denied the faith. So what do you mean? You know, if you, if you think about that, if you deny, if you're not working, you denied the faith, you know, could a, could a Christian not work? Well, yeah, he can't work. Well, should, obviously, should he work? Of course he should work. But from him, from him not working, laying on the couch, being a lazy loafer and stuff like that, if he's a born-again child of God or whatever, that just didn't lose his salvation. He denied, he denied the faith in the aspect of what Paul told him. Okay, so the, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Sometimes that word faith is used more than just faith in, yeah, believing in, in salvation and stuff. So the work of their, the work of faith is they're working because they believed on, you know, I, I believe on Jesus Christ, therefore I'm going to start serving them and stuff like that. You know, you could make some practical application with that is, yeah, once by faith I trusted in the gospel, now I'm going to serve the Lord. Now it's up to my, you know, my service and stuff. All right, look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. Let's look at another time this word shows up. 1 Timothy 5, look at verse 21. He says, I charge thee before God. And this is interesting. Now here's the other time this word's used. And look what this is in context for. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou, shalt, thou, that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing but partiality. So you got elect used in the Bible, speaking of Jacob, speaking of Israel. Um, one of the verses in there speaking about Jesus Christ uh, uh, as, 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 as the elect also. I don't know where, where that verse is at. It might have been, it might have been Isaiah somewhere. Um, then there's another time, okay, elect has to do with our service. We're elected to do things. And in this one here, it's talking about the elect angels. Now you could kind of... Uh, you know, um, you could say, well, the elect angels, because think about it, there's some angels that are still going to rebel in the future. Okay, Revelation chapter 12, the angels that, that the devil cast, I don't believe, you know, they could be, maybe, you know, they could be the angels that rebelled way back, you know, way back when, you know, during the time of Noah, we know certain angels, in a sense, rebelled. And I believe those angels got cast down into the, into the heart of the earth reserved on judgment and stuff but then there could be angels that um that are, are you know the elect angels certain angels obey what the lord says but other other angels fall still there's still going to be a bunch of fallen angels but i just want to show you that that reference there too now how about look at second timothy 2 10 let's keep looking at this this word here second timothy 2 10 and this is what we have to do though this is laborsome this is tiresome but we got to go through the bible we got to go through these verses in See, is this elect? Is this election have to do with eradicating my choice, and God just placed me in unconditionally and all this stuff? We got to go through these. Look at Second Timothy, chapter two, verse ten. Second Timothy, chapter two. Um, look at verse ten. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sakes. Okay that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And I believe right there, I endure all things for the elect's sakes. Now, who was Paul really persecuted by? What was the, why was Paul ever even thrown in jail? Israel. Over and over again. He has a heart for Jews. He, he had a heart for the nation of Israel, for them to get saved. And he says, I endure all things for the, elect, for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Um, there's another good verse in here too. All right, how about um, how about Titus Titus one one? Come to Titus one one. Titus one. Verse one. We're definitely not going to be able to get through all these. No way. Titus chapter one. Um, look at verse number one. Titus chapter one. Look at verse one. Paul, servant of God. In the apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Okay, so there you go again. You got according to the faith of God's elect. 
Now who now who is that? Is that the faith of God's elect of you know speaking of the body of Christ, or is it speaking of Israel? And I, once again, I would kind of, I would lean towards talking about Israel, um, according to the faith of God's elect. Uh, okay, how about um, let's see. How about uh, uh, elect according to foreknowledge? Let's go to let's go to First uh, Peter. Let's go to First Peter. Look at First Peter chapter, chapter one. First Peter chapter one. All right, First Peter chapter one. All right, now here, here's ta uh, Peter talking. He says, "Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit." Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace be multiplied. So it goes on with the elect, but notice though that the elect is conditioned. Okay, it's elect according to something, according to the foreknowledge of God. Now you could look at it like, okay, I'm gonna give the gospel to somebody. You know, now God has 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 a foreknowledge of those who receive and reject. He has a foreknowledge, but he don't just, you know, he he don't just. Uh, you know, override their free will and make the decision for them. But I don't doubt at all that God knows, okay, who's going to receive him and who's going to re uh, reject him there. Look at, uh, how about second, uh, First Peter chapter 2, verse, um, and actually, let's, go, let's look at Exodus. Let's go back to Old Testament. Let's look at Exodus chapter 4. Look at Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. Um, verse uh, 20, 22. Okay, then we got to, okay, so look at Exodus chapter 4. Let's see, let's look at verse 22. Okay, he talks about, um, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. All right, uh, Israel becomes his, their, uh, you know, God's firstborn son. Look at look at uh, Exodus nineteen; they become a nation. Look at Exodus nineteen. This is like their their calling, their election. Okay, look at uh, look at Exodus nineteen. Look at verse five and six. Okay, this is where God, he, you know, then he chooses them to become a nation. He elects them to become a nation. Look at Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Now, that once again, what's the point of saying if, if, there's no, if they have no free will, if there's no condition to it? If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words uh, which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. All right, look at, look at Leviticus. Once, uh, in, uh, Leviticus 22. Once again, in connection with service. Look at Leviticus 22. Look at verse 55. Leviticus 22. There you 55. Let's see here. Um, well, here's a good verse. Here. You can find something in here. Look at Leviticus 22, verse 29. And you will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving unto the Lord. Offer it at your own will. I mean, that's pretty clear right there. Offer it at your own will. Um, man, we're at 35. I, know. I had the wrong... I don't know. I was had the wrong thing here. Um... That'll do just as good as, as it all. Now look at uh, now let's come to Ephesians. Let's look at another passage which they're which they're used. We'll probably probably have to stop. Yeah, definitely we have to stop under U. We're definitely not going to get to L. No way. All right, look at Ephesians chapter one. Let's see here. Let's look at uh, let's look at this idea of you know they they use these two words synonymously kind of. They use elect and then also chosen. Okay, so these are the, so here's the other word here. Okay, the word okay, the word elect. We could see that it most likely has to deal with Israel, Jesus Christ, 
um, service, something to do with service. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse, let's look at verse 4. All right, this is, this is definitely one of their biggest, their biggest passages on the whole thing of predestination. Look at Ephesians 1 verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now what is this choosing? That, I would circle that, that we should be holy. Okay, he chosen us, and now I would also cir circle, in him before the foundation of the world, that we should uh, be holy without blame before, uh, before him in love. Now look at this part. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. And it doesn't say predestinated unto us unto salvation. Now do you remember that verse in Galatians? Well, how do we become a child of God? By faith in Jesus Christ. For we are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ having predestinated, un, uh, predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good, good pleasure of his will. Now, when it keeps going. It's a comma. To the, praise of his, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Okay, we're accepted in the beloved. So there's, remember, there's a couple of things where you know, once you, what's the condition, though, of being accepted in the beloved? You have to be in Christ. You say, you got to know these, the, the, these certain words and how, you know, how they're, they're twisting them. Say, well, look, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So they say, look, before the foundation of the world, you were already chosen to salvation or not chosen to salvation. Okay? But that's not what it says. Okay, you keep reading, to the praise and glory of his grace, when he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now think about it. I wasn't even around in the found before the foundation of the world. Well, who was around? Well, Christ was. Christ was around before the before the foundation of the world. Um, that, that's, you keep reading this passage, though. Uh, look at verse number. Keep going down. Uh, verse number uh, thirteen. Like, what is the condition? You know, even ver even verse twelve. Well, go back to verse eleven. This whole thing talks about this. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. All right, that'd be God's part. All right, God, but you know, he, he uh, it says right there, we have obtained an inheritance. Okay, we have, now what's inheritance associated with in the Bible? I don't, have to, I don't want to run those references. Earned rewards in the book of Colossians. Okay? Earned rewards. Now, how that works out, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That would be God's part. Now, look at verse 12, though. That, notice it continues. That we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. That would be your part. God's look when 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 it says it's it's not a it's not a view that runneth or it's it's not a view that willeth, you know you can't will yourself to get saved. It had to be God's will on how he on how he was going to decide to save you. God's will was a plan that he had from the before the foundation of the world. He was gonna the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He was gonna die for your sins, buried, resurrect the third day. Okay, that was God's will. It's not, it's not your will in a sense of, I, I'm going to will myself to get saved and I'll figure out according to my... No, okay? You have to trust who first trusted in Christ. Then he goes on even more. In whom you also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So there's a part of trusting and believing, and when it comes to receiving the gospel, there, that is not a work by any stretch of the imagination, okay? Um, all right, let's look at, uh, um, let's see, let's look at uh, one, uh, De Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy 7.6 on this choosing. Deuteronomy 7.6. I got, man, I got a little, I got a little bit more. We're going to finish off on this calling, or this choosing, once again, to a specific service. Look at Deuteronomy 
7 6. Deuteronomy 7 6. Alright, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Okay, look what he says here. He says, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. That's why I think we're, you know, when Paul's talking about, you know, as the elect, holy and blame, I believe he's talking about Israel. Be as, you know, as, that's all he had was the Old Testament back then anyways, too. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of this earth. And the Lord did not set his love. And he goes on, um, you know, continue, continue reading against all these things about all these conditions of, you know, the Lord blessing them. And, you know, even verse 17, he talks about, if thou shalt say in thy heart, these nations are more than I, how can I dispose them? Thou shalt not be afraid. And he gives them more, these more conditions and things and more laws to follow. But, the calling and, or the choosing there is for a service. Look at um, Isaiah 43. Did I go over that one? Let's see. Let's, try, let's look at Isaiah 43. Isaiah chapter 43. I can't remember if I got Isaiah 43 or 45. Look at Isaiah 43. Let's see. Verse number... Um, yeah, look at Isaiah 43, verse 10. You are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. For before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after. But once again, you could see I have chosen, whom I have chosen. For what? He's my servant, that ye may know and believe. Right there, choosing is for service again. Look at... Let's see, look at Isaiah 44. Look at Isaiah 44, um, verse 1. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Um, Thus saith the Lord that made thee, I formed thee from the womb, which, uh, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, uh, Jer Jerusalem, whom I have chosen. Okay, there he goes again. Jacob, Israel. So that's pretty clear with that. How about, um, how about Romans 1? Let's go get some application to us now. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans 1, 7. All right, we're kind of going, going all around here. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 7. And we'll stop with like five more verses here. Look at Romans 1, 7. Um, all right, here's a certain, certain calling. Um, uh, Romans 1, 7, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, there's a calling um, of, to be, you know, a calling um, called to be saints. Okay, this, isn't, this is not a calling to salvation or chosen to salvation. How about, uh, look at Acts 9. Here, or Acts 9, this actually has the word chosen in it. Here, Acts 9, verse 15. All right, how about, you know, Paul's choosing? What is, what, is, what is his choosing? Look at Acts 9. Acts 9, 15. Acts 9, 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. All right, for what? to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So when you see that word chosen there, once again, there's going to be a, uh, some type of context of, okay, it's for a service. You're not chosen to get saved or chosen, you know, God only chose this certain amount of people and didn't choose these other groups of people or nothing. How about, um, let's see. How about, look at, look at 1 Corinthians one twenty seven. I like this verse a lot because here's kind of the types of people that, that God chooses in a sense. But once again, though, this isn't, this isn't in the sense of uh, salvation, but this is just a good 
Uh, it's a good verse. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.27. I love this verse. 1 Corinthians one twenty seven. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world, that would be me, to confound the wise. Ain't that something? God chosen the foolish things of the world, people that are stupid, dumb, abased, pretty much amount to nothing, to really confound people that are, think that they're wise and intellectual. And it's amazing how the, the types of people that God chooses. I mean, a bunch of nobodies. The weak things of the world to confound the Things that are weak, base things in the world, despise, you know, things that are despised, and hath God chosen? Yea, the things which are not to bring to not the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who, uh, who of God has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and all that. Now, so in order, here, this is to recap a little bit. In order to get saved, we've got to receive what Jesus Christ did for you. Once you are in Christ, you're predestinated. Once you're in Christ, I was thinking like this too, you know, once you're in Christ, in a sense, you do go back to the foundation of the world. The only way you go back to the foundation of the world is because you're in Christ. That puts you in the body of Christ. The body of Christ didn't even start until after the cross. And he placed people in the body of Christ, in, I believe in Acts chapter 2 and stuff. There was no body of Christ over here. Adam wasn't in the body of Christ. Noah wasn't in nobody. Abraham wasn't in the body of Christ. If he was in the body of Christ, would he go into the heart of the earth for and all that? You know, in Abraham's bosom. So once you're in Christ, your destination is fixed. You are predestined unto, um, uh, uh, well, and that's, in that case, even in a, in a, for, a certain, um, for a certain service, and your, pre, your, your destination is fixed. It also says we're predestinated to be what? To, conf, to be conformed to the image of his son. So once we're in Christ, there's our destination fixed again. Um, let's look at uh, a couple more verses here. On what about? Um, let's see. I want I want that verse in Proverbs. How about this verse in Proverbs here? Proverbs chapter one, verse twenty-four. Okay, then you know the next one would be limited atonement. We're gonna we'll pick up these in another day here. Well, here limited atonement. Um, irresistible grace. And I'll just do a brief recap and we'll close here. Um, and then perseverance. Perseverance of the saints. All right, limited atonement. It's that, that's the next one. But look, just look at this passage in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24. Um... Because the irresistible grace, this would be one, really one against that. But he says, because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. You didn't care nothing about the counsel of God. You didn't want to get reproved. You didn't want to get rebuked or nothing. Therefore, look what the Lord is going to do. I will also laugh at your clemency. I will mock when your fear cometh. Ain't that something? For uh, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Why? For they that hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. That's a, a big one on choosing right there. Now, the next one, okay, we'll, go, we'll cover this probably next week or so. All right, you got limited atonement. All right, I'd write down the L, limited atonement, and I'd write down uh, pretty much what that is about is uh, they, were, they were teach that Christ only died for the elect people, okay? Um, and we're going to see clearly that Christ died for mankind. Now, I heard Calvinists beforehand say some things because, you know, they're, they're, they're run with some things with... Um, you know, like universal salvation. I clearly don't believe in universal salvation. That way everybody, you know, everybody's saved. Um, that, you know, one verse in the Bible, the Lord says, I would that all men would be saved. Yeah, I, yeah that would be a great, great thing, okay? God, the Lord's not willing any should perish and all that. But sadly they do. Okay, that, that's, that's a part of it. So, 
there's, it's not the far extreme where, you know, uh, everybody's saved, universal salvation, and it's not the other side of it where no, only the elect saved and Christ only really came to shed his blood for specific, you know, for specific people. Um, that'd be limited atonement. Um, and then the next one, irresistible grace, which pretty much teaches that God's grace can, cannot be resisted. Okay. And then the last one, that P, is perseverance of the saints. And um, I think nowadays, I think they might have changed it. I have to look up again. They, I think they might have changed it to uh, preservation of the saints. But perseverance is something that, you know, that you had to persevere. You had to endure to the end. We'll look up a couple quotes on John Calvin himself saying, you know, you, ha you have to continue to endure, endure to the end and stuff. And Which is wild is, well, what group of people has to endure to the end? The Jews. So you could see a lot of things in Calvinism, how they really, they really put themselves as God's elect. They really put themselves and tried to claim every single thing that was talking about the nation of Israel. So I think that's, that's enough for tonight. We're going to we'll cover those, uh, these, those three other acronyms uh, another night. Let's bow our head for closing prayer. All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I just thank you for your word, Lord. I just pray that you continue to um, open up your book to us, Lord. And uh, if, if anybody be, be caught in a heresy of Calvinism, Lord, um, just help use your book, Lord, to uh, just to reprove that. And just we just thank you, Lord, that we have received the gospel, Lord, and we have put our faith in trust in what you've done for us, Lord, to save our souls. And um, Lord, just pray that you continue to use us, help sanctify us, Lord, like your like your book says that, uh, we may be vessels unto honor, uh, fit for the Master's use. I pray, Lord, that you uh, help clean us up, Lord, from the inside. Help us be more obedient and uh, just give us a, a, an attentive ear and um, just a submissive heart, Lord, to listen to, to what you want us to do. And um, We thank you, Lord, and we love you, and we give you all the praise and glory tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty, thank you. We'll be doing uh, verse, verse memorization. Ephesians 6, verse 12 for, for next week. Um, yeah, middle...